Welcome to SCC Total Boiler Room Solutions 101. In this webinar, we're going to talk about the product overview. So we're going to go through all the features and functions that are available and all the various panels and touchscreens that are available in the SCC Total Boiler Room Solutions. But first, let's talk a little bit about the webinar dashboard and how you can use it. When you first logged in, hopefully you got a dashboard that looks something like this. If you only see this gray bar here on the left, if you click on the orange arrow, it'll expand into this larger dashboard. You have a couple of audio options here. One is to use the computer audio, another is to use the phone call, and then there's a no audio option here. You may be set to default on the no audio option, and so you may not be hearing me right now. If that's the case, select either phone call or computer audio. If you select the phone call option, you'll be presented with a number to dial into and also an access code that you can use to dial into the meeting. A couple other things you want to take a look at are the questions and the handout sections of the dashboard. We're not going to answer questions in real time during the presentation in order to kind of keep things moving and flowing through. Uh, but if you have a question, feel free to type it into the questions section here. And to do that, you're going to click on this little arrow at the bottom here of the, on the left side of the question bar, and it'll pull up a question panel where you can type in a, a question like the one here. How can you buy two panels right now? <laughs> <clears throat> Once you've typed out your question, you can click the send button, and then it'll come to me, and I'll aggregate all these various questions, and at the end, we'll take some time to go through and answer them. If you click on the little drop-down arrow on the handouts bar, you'll get a handout section that pops up. And in this handout section, there will be various downloads that you can download for reference from this webinar. Um, in this one, we're gonna have the presentation slides available. Um, in future webinars, there may be technical instructions here that you can download or um, other quizzes perhaps, or other information about the product line, okay? So with that administrative stuff out of the way, let's dive right in. <clears throat> So, Total Boiler Room Solutions. Now, some of you may know these products as our touchscreen kits and touchscreen panels and touchscreen products. Um, the reason we call them Total Boiler Room Solutions is because what we're really trying to do here is tie the boiler room together and give you one cohesive control solution for the whole boiler room. Okay, so we're not only going to capture information about the boiler, but we're also going to tie in things like the DA tank or surge tank or chemical feed pumps, or blowdown heat recovery systems. Maybe VFDs that are attached to all various kinds of pumps, the burner blower, um, there might be additional pumps out there that are pumping condensate back. Uh, you might have water level controls that are installed on all these various tanks. You might have metering in involved, fuel flow metering, water flow metering, steam flow metering, and all these various devices can connect back to our control systems that give one nice system that the end user can use. You might have things like economizer monitoring or even a draft control program. And at the end of the day, all of this needs to be communicated back to the building management system, okay? And the, the engineering teams that put together the building design, one nice selling point for them is that they don't have to connect to all these different devices now. And they don't have to worry about translating all the different protocols that are out there all they have to do is make one connection to maybe a master panel or maybe a protocol converter, and they have all the information about everything that's going on in the boiler room from just that one connection. And so the ultimate goal is to provide one cohesive control solution for the end user in the building so that everything works together and everything is presented neatly, okay? So if we take a look at the product offering breakdown, the touchscreen panels and products break down into three sort of separate categories. The first are touchscreens at the boiler, okay? So these are gonna be touchscreens that are mounted next to the burner or next to the boiler itself. There's also what we call DA panels. Now these are gonna be connected to DA tanks or surge tanks or condensate tanks um, that then feed water into the boiler. And then there's master panel, okay? The master lead lag panel actually connects multiple boilers together and controls 
the boiler firing rate to meet a specific set point for the header steam pressure or header water temperature. Okay. So the touchscreens at the boiler break down into two different categories. There are TS kits or touchscreen kits, and there are also what we call combustion enclosures. Okay. And we're going to go through the differences between those two in a couple of slides here. The DA panel, you can have a single panel for a DA tank, a surge tank, or a condensate tank. You can also have what we call combination panels, which allows you to control up to two tanks, say a DA tank and a surge tank, by using one panel. And then the master panel is just the master panel on its own. Okay. Now, it's important to remember that these products are not custom. These products are canned software packages that are almost infinitely configurable. Okay? And what I mean by that is that you're not going to come order a panel from us and say, all right, well, I've got three analog inputs on this one, and I need two RTD sensors, and I need it to do this special little program. You know, and we're going to say, okay, cool. Well, let me take that information, and we'll write up a new PLC program for it and, and tag it with your name or something like that and ship it out to you. That's, that's not what we do here. Okay? We have a team of about 10 to oh, – I'm sorry – we have a team of about eight people in the office and then another seven or eight people in the warehouse that are building and designing this program and these panels. Okay? So the program that gets shipped out on every single one of these touchscreens at the boiler is the same okay? because all you're going to do is order it with the right hardware in it and then enable the different features and functions in the program to access that hardware and do all the features and functions that you need. Okay? You're not ordering custom programs from us. And that gives us the ability to, one, support you better because everything is documented exactly the right way. And two, it gives you the ability to get on and off the job faster because you don't have a custom program that we've got to troubleshoot every time it comes out. Okay? We've troubleshooted everything that there is in these programs, and we've got the support in order to, to get you through any issue you might be having. Okay? And everybody is pretty familiar with our tech support hotline. Um, it's, it's a really great group of guys. They do a killer job. Um, troubleshooting any issues you might see in the field. Okay? So it's just important to remember this is not custom. These aren't science projects. You're going to have to go back and forth with a bunch of time. These programs have been designed and checked, and they've been in the field for years now, and it's, it's not custom. These are a standard product, and you just can configure them however you like. Okay? So the first one we're going to talk about is the touchscreen at the boiler. Okay? Touchscreens at the boiler consist of touchscreen kits and combustion enclosures. Okay? Let's talk first about the touchscreen kits. Now, some of you may have heard that we're coming out with some new features on our touchscreen kits. We've recently done an upgrade on the programming for our local touchscreen kits. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the new features, and I've highlighted them in the red as we go through here. Okay? When you order a touchscreen kit, you can either order it in an enclosure, like I'm showing here on the top, or you can order it as a kit without an enclosure. Basically, all of the equipment mounted on a back pan and then a touchscreen that's sold or shipped separately, I'm sorry, and then you connect the two together. And this is very common for, let's say, a, a burner OEM that's going to install it on their own burner cabinet. Okay. So first up, it's important to know that in a touchscreen kit, there are no LMVs inside of this panel or back pan. Okay. This is going to connect to a touch or an LMV3 or an LMV5. Okay? You can order these now with a 3, 6, 10, 12, or even up to a 15-inch touchscreen now. Okay? That's new. It used to only go up to a 10-inch. We can have an alarm history here in each panel that saves up to 250 faults and alarms, and they're all written out in clear English. So there's no code you have to look up. It just says right there on the screen what the alarm history was. You can also add email and, email and text messaging to these panels. So if you connect these panels to the Ethernet, or to the Internet, excuse me, you can program in up to six different email or text messaging phone numbers, and then whenever the boiler goes into an alarm, it will automatically send an email or text message to those addresses. You can also grab screenshots from the touchscreen and then email those pictures out as well uh, if you wanted to send an example to somebody or maybe send something in for troubleshooting. You can include BMS protocols in these local touchscreen panels. Okay. Oddbus TCP IP is standard, and I'm explaining in a little couple, couple of later slides why, typically speaking, 
Modbus, the standard Modbus is all you really need to have in these local panels because either the master panel or a protocol converter is going to take care of the translation to whatever BMS applications you have. You can order these in a NEMA 1, a NEMA 12, or a NEMA 4X enclosure, and you can get all of these with um, cooling fans if you need them. You can also have up to two RW55s for temperature, pressure, and water level control. Okay, So you can have an RW55 that acts as, say, a load controller if you're using, let's say, an LMV3, or maybe you want a load controller external from the LMV5, sorry. And you can also have an RW55 installed for water level control. So you can control the water level of your boiler using that RW55 that's connected to uh, our other water level products. Uh, and you can show it right there on your screen where the water in the boiler is. Now, all of those items that we just talked about come in the touchscreen program ready to go, okay? And you don't need an additional PLC, which we call the expanded enunciator, okay? This expanded enunciator essentially is this PLC right here that you see in this back pan, okay? And we call it an expanded enunciator because it allows you to enunciate other pieces of information than just your standard inputs and outputs on the LV5. So, you now have detailed enunciation in 14 digital inputs, okay? It used to be 13, we added one more. Now, you can also have up to 16 analog inputs, okay? In the past, we had four analog inputs that could be assigned to 420 or 0 to 10, and we also had four RTD inputs for economizer monitoring, and then four additional RTD inputs that you could assign to whatever inputs you needed, okay? Now, we actually have 16 analog inputs, and you can assign them to various types of inputs or analog signals. Okay, you have 420, 010, RTD inputs, and you can now actually have thermal couple inputs. Okay, and these analog inputs could be used for um, fuel flow metering, steam flow metering, water flow metering, uh, economizer monitoring, uh, temperature differential across, let's say, uh, a bloat on heat recovery system. Uh, anything you can think of, you can assign those inputs, name them, and then you have that information, and you can use that information using these local touch screens. We also have digital and analog outputs, okay? So you can have a contact close, essentially, to command something else to run or open or turn off, okay? And that's a digital output. We also have analog outputs that you can use to send a 420 signal to some other device in the boiler room or back to a control panel somewhere. Um, and that can be used to, say, relay what the burner firing rate is at any time, perhaps. These touchscreen kits also can have a built-in draft control program, okay? So when you option that in, it gives you the ability to do draft control straight from this panel. Now, this draft control program is a UL-listed program, um, <clears throat> and it's used to control a stack damper, essentially. So draft control allows you to maintain a specific set point of pressure on the furnace itself. Um, and the reason you do that is so that if there's a lot of negative pressure being created by maybe a very tall stack, it'll prevent that negative pressure from actually sucking the flame off the burner head, okay? So you see draft control in, all, in places where they have really tall stacks, typically. Uh, you see this in New York a lot. Um, and this draft control program utilizes uh, a Siemens actuator um, with a differential pressure transducer and a differential pressure switch um, to enable, basically, a, a, the control of the damper to maintain a set point, which is usually somewhere in, like, the negative one-inch water column range. Okay, but that, that can be optioned in and it's just built into the, the PLC program. <clears throat> you can also do three element feed water control now. Okay, so this is built into the, the touchscreen program. And so you can use a steam flow meter, a water flow meter, and then also a differential pressure transducer to do three element feed water control. Data logging, trending, and totalization is also something that comes along with these local touchscreen kits. <clears throat> Basically, you can, you can pull the data into the touchscreen. Um, you can log it to a USB drive. You can also trend it uh, on a screen that shows you a graph of what's going on with different inputs. And basically, you can use any Modbus address that's available from the LMB, from the analog inputs and outputs, or the, the, uh, the digital inputs and outputs um, that are coming to the PLC. Any piece of information that has a Modbus address, we can data log and trend, okay? And then we can also totalize the analog input signals 
for let's say a fuel flow meter or a steam flow meter. Um, and using all this information, you can actually even do a real-time fuel to steam efficiency calculation and show it right there on the screen. We can also do a VFD circulation pump control. So in the past, some of you may already know that we can do pump control on off as a standard. Okay? But we can also now do a VFD controlled pump from this touchscreen kit. Okay? So this is a circulation pump local to the boiler itself, um, and that's a new feature. So on the panel itself, this is what a typical home screen would look like for a touchscreen kit at the boiler. Okay? So this is one that has an LMV5 in it that has the O2 trim. Okay? So right from the screen, you can see at a glance kind of everything that's going on with your boiler. You've got your, your process variable and your set point. Okay? So we're a little below set point. We're running gas. Our ambient air temperature is 70 degrees. We've got our actuator positions down here. We know that we're actually a lag two boiler. Okay? So we've we're uh, being controlled by a master panel. Here's your feed water control. So your set point's at 23, and you're actually only at 22 inches, so you're a little low there. Get your fuel fuel temperature, or I'm sorry, your flue temperature here, and also an auxiliary three actuator position. Then you have your actual oxygen and efficiency calculation in the top right here. Okay, so we're running at 3% O2, and our combustion efficiency is 92.7%. Okay, we also know right here at the top that we are in normal operation. So, moving on to the combustion enclosures. Now, we call these retrofits in a box because these are going to have the LMV3 or the LMV5 inside of the panel itself, okay? And you would use these to do basically a controls retrofit. You can just take this panel, drop it in, and it would have the LMV3, the LMV5, all the various uh, hardware and terminals inside of it, and all you need to do is wire the end devices back to this panel. So you can see that on this panel, we've got, you know, a fuel selector switch. We've got a burner on off switch. We've got all the indicator lights, um, quite a bit different than the touchscreen kit, which didn't have any of those, on, any of those uh, buttons and, and lights on there. Okay. So this is really designed to get you on and off the job quickly when you're doing a controls retrofit. So these local touchscreens have all the same features and functions as the local touchscreen kit. Okay, what we're doing though is we're just making it so that you can make an easy retrofit by adding in the LMV3 and the LMV5, and then also the buttons and the switches. Something you can add to this panel is actually three-phase power. Okay, so you can add in the blower motor, oil pump, air compressor, motor starters if you're doing motor starter controlled, or you could actually add in VSD three-phase fuses for those same motors and pumps and compressors. Okay, so that's different from like just the local touchscreen kit. Okay. <clears throat> so coming back to our, our product offering breakdown here, we've now covered the touchscreens at the boiler, the TS kits that don't have LMVs, and the combustion enclosures, the retrofits in a box. So the next item we're going to talk about now are the DA panels, okay, where we can connect these to a DA, a surge, a condensate tank, or a combination panel. So DA, surge, and condensate panels. Like we were just saying, you can control a DA, a surge, a condensate, or a combination of those, those three. You have a 6-inch or 10-inch screen. There's handoff auto selection switches for each one of the pumps. So if for some reason the screen goes down or the PLC gets damaged, you're able to control the pumps with these handoff auto switches manually. You can control up to six pumps per panel. Okay, So if you had a DA tank that had six pumps and you need one panel for that DA tank. You can also add in water level control and tank pressure control using the RW55s. So you'll see here that we have a uh, water level controller and a we could have another one for tank pressure control if you're doing a DA tank obviously. The DA panel a surge tank panel and contact panel, the main function here is to lead lag the feed water pumps based on a constant set point, or we can do a header pressure offset. Okay, so for a, a surge tank or contact tank, you're just going to maintain a certain transfer pump pressure, essentially, in a, in a transfer pump header pressure that's feeding water into either a D tank, probably into a DA tank. Okay, if you have a DA tank that's feeding water into your boiler, we can set that up to have a constant set point. So let's say your boiler is running at 125 PSI 
and you want to run your feed water at 150 psi. Okay, we could say, okay, I want the DA tank to command these pumps such that we always maintain 150 psi going into the boiler. Now, the other option you have is to do what we call header pressure offset. Now, what this says is I always want to maintain a certain differential in between the feed water pressure that I'm sending into the boilers and the actual boiler pressure, okay? So maybe for that application, you say, okay, I always want to maintain a 25 PSI offset. And that means if the boiler pressure changes from, let's say, 125 PSI down to 100, 100 PSI, now your feed water pressure is going to match it. It's going to move with it. So instead of staying at 150 PSI when the boiler pressure is at 100 PSI, it's going to come down to 125 PSI because you set up a differential of 25 PSI. And that's really nice because it's going to save you money on the pumps if you're using BFD pumps. And it's also going to save you on the wear and tear of your feed water valves. So it's a really nice feature uh, in the DA, DA, uh, DA panels. It's also going to rotate the pumps based on runtime hours, so you don't ever use one pump more than other pumps. And you can control makeup water and transfer valves with these tanks um, to basically control the water level in, in the tank itself. You can use these panels to monitor the high, low, and low, low water levels. Um, we monitor the low, low water level. You need to have a mechanical auxiliary device that, that's your safety low, low water level still. Uh, and then just like the, the touchscreen kits in the local boilers, you're going to have alarms and statuses saved into this touchscreen up to 250, and the alarm and statuses are all going to be in a clear English format. Okay. And then lastly, you can add in building management communications to this panel as well. Uh, and again, like I was saying in the touchscreen kit slide, we don't typically need to do that. You can just keep the standard Modbus TCP IP um, in this panel specifically, because it's usually going to connect to a master panel or a protocol converter that's going to translate this more efficiently than having one in the panel. But if you just have a single DA panel that doesn't have any other of our systems involved, then maybe you do need to add in, it, let's say, a back end protocol into this panel. Okay. Now, each one of these panels can control a single tank, but these panels could also be set up to control two tanks at once. Okay. So sometimes they have what's called a split tank. I'm going to show an image of that in a second, where they have in a single tank, there's a DA on one side of the tank, and then maybe a surge tank on the other side of the tank, and there's just a separator in the middle of the tank to separate those two compartments. Um, and you can actually control both of those compartments with a single panel as long as you have six pumps total or less, okay? And those pumps have to be in a configuration of four feed water going into the boiler and two transfer going in from the surge into the DA, okay? It could be, those are the maximums, four and two. So it could be like three and one or three and two, um, but up to four feed water and up to two transfer pumps, which is a, a pretty typical configuration in the industry. Now it doesn't have to be a split tank specifically, it could be two separate tanks. And as long as the pumping numbers are the same, four and two, then you can have one panel that can actually control two separate tanks um, together. So if you click on, or if you look at the screen here, here's a typical surge tank screen. And in this surge tank screen, you can see you've got your pumps, you've got two pumps down here. You can see which one's lead, LD, and which one's lag one, LG one, okay? These round circles, or these round uh, displays here are telling us what the pump is doing. So it's right now it's being commanded in auto. It's being commanded on because it's green, okay? The, the second one's off. It's in auto, but it's off right now. That's why it's white, okay? The squares at the bottom are actually the feedback signals, okay? So right now, it's green because we're telling the pump to be on. And down here, this is green because our feedback signal is telling us, yes, the pump is on, so we're good. In the second one here, we're saying, okay, we're commanding it to be off, and the feedback signal is white, and so it's off, and so that's all good. If for some reason this was green and this was still white, then that's a problem because you're, you're telling the pump to turn on, but the pump isn't telling us that it is on, and so then it's going to probably jump to the next pump given a certain timer, okay? On the right here, you have some more information about the, the tank itself. You've got your water level set point, your actual water level, your tank pressure set point, and then your actual tank pressure, okay? And then the water temperature as well. Now, this is that split tank I was telling you about, OK? 
Okay, so in this application, we have one panel that's controlling essentially two different tanks. You have a DA tank on the left side here and a surge tank on the right side. Okay, and now here's that configuration of four to two. Okay, we've got four feed water pumps and then we've got two transfer pumps. You can see here, pump one and pump two, lead one and lag one are being commanded on in order to feed the boilers. And then both transfer pumps, the lead one, lead pump and lag pump are both on right now, moving water from the surge tank into the DA tank. Okay. On the left side of the screen, you've got all your DA data. So you've got your water level set point and actual water level. And you also have your feed water pressure set point and your feed water pressure right here as well. Okay. On the surge data side, we have the water level set point and the actual water level. And we have the transfer pump pressure set point and the transfer pump actual pressure. Okay. And then your water temperature on your surge tank side. So now if we go back to the product offering breakdown, we've covered here our DA panel and our touchscreen at the boiler. And now we're going to move on to the master panel. So the master panel is going to lead lag the boilers and sort of tie everything together. The master panel can come with a 7, 10, 12, or 15 inch screen, and it can lead lag up to eight boilers. Okay? And by lead lag, I mean basically telling the boilers what firing rate to go to in order to meet a header pressure set point. Okay? So when it lead lag, it's going to automatically rotate the boilers so that one boiler doesn't get used more than others. And then it can lead lag them using parallel or sequential modulation. Okay? Parallel sequencing essentially means that it's going to try and keep the set point of the header constant by turning boilers on and off, but then getting those boilers all at the same firing rate. Okay? So it'll turn boiler one on. It'll drive it up to, let's say, 80 or 90%. And there's settings in there that you set up that says, okay, if I'm above 80%, let's say for five minutes, go ahead and turn on the second boiler. Okay. So boiler one's been on, it's above 80 for too long. It says, okay, turn boiler two on. Now that boiler two is on, it's going to allow boiler two to come up and boiler one to come down slightly until they are equal in firing rate. So maybe boiler one was up around 85% and now it comes down to maybe 65% and boiler two comes up to say 65%. And now they're both going to be at 65 and the, and the lead lag panel, the master panel is going to bring them up and down together. Okay. And that's called parallel modulation. Okay. Sequential modulation would be as if you took boiler one all the way up to high fire and then the master panel said, okay, I don't have enough power, turn on boiler two. And then boiler one would stay at high fire and boiler two would, would just move around as needed in order to meet the load. And that's called sequential modulation. You can connect the master panel directly to an LMV, or you can connect it to a local touchscreen kit. Okay, what that means is that you don't have to have a touchscreen at each boiler in order to use the master panel. Okay, you could have just LMV3s or just LMV5s at the boiler, and you can connect those to the master panel. Uh, and I'm going to go through some different examples on how we connect all, all this together in different situations um, in a couple of, couple of minutes here. You can also use this master panel to monitor the DA surge or condensate panel that we just talked about. And it also doesn't need to be in the boiler room. Okay, the master panel can be in a separate control room, um, can be somewhere else in the building. Um, you can actually have even more than one where you have a repeater essentially where there's two master panels um, controlling the same system and they just mirror each other as you, as you click through them. Okay, so there's a lot of options here. From the master panel, you can actually view each boiler or tank individually. So you can pull the screen that just shows you boiler one or just shows you boiler two, and you can sort of read what's going on with that boiler specifically. You can have up to four analog inputs and four RTD inputs in the panel. Okay, now these master panels can be set up for a steam application where you automatically have four analog inputs because you're going to need at least one analog input for the header pressure sensor. Or you can have a hot water master panel where you automatically have four RTD inputs because you're going to need one for the header temperature sensor. If you have a steam system, you can option in those four additional RTD inputs. And if you have a hot water system, you can actually option in those four additional analog inputs. And those are useful for monitoring other, other things inside of the boiler room 
um, that maybe don't fit into the, the local touchscreen kits or the DA panel, um, something else, a piece of information you want to gather that then send back to the building management system. So you can also add the BMS communications to this panel. Now, this is where you typically will add a protocol like BACnet or Ethernet or Profinet or Profibus, uh, a lot of nets. But you would add those back into the master panel, you add that, that protocol into the master panel, and that way all the other panels that are in the room can just have the standard Modbus, and then this master panel will do all the translation to the correct BMS protocol. So this is what a typical overview screen would look like on the master panel. Okay, so this is a hot water system, and you can see here we've got our supply temperature is 158, and our set point is actually 180 degrees Fahrenheit, so we're low right now. You can see here that boiler one and boiler two are running, and they're in phase 60. Okay, that's what this number means. You can see that boiler one is the lead boiler. The local set point is 180, and the local pressure is 100, or I'm sorry, local temperature is 174 degrees, okay? And the firing rate's at 100%. So for each boiler, you get this little summary here that tells you what's going on at the boiler itself, okay? We have an outside air temperature connected to this uh, master panel, so you can see the outside air temperature. And you'll see this little camera button down here that I didn't talk about on the other screen, but this is that screenshot option that we were talking about. So if you wanted to, you could take a screenshot of this screen itself, and then you could email it out to somebody if you needed to. Now, if I were to click on any one of these boilers, it would pull up a image of that boiler itself. Okay, now this looks just like the screen we were on before, that shows you the local boiler, okay? So this is just like what you would see at the local touchscreen kit. So you got your process variable and set point, you got the, the uh, flame signal and output, or I'm sorry, the, the firing rate, and all that information that we looked at before, okay? So <clears throat> we've talked about touchscreens at the boiler, the touchscreen kits and the combustion enclosures. We've also talked about the DA panel, which consists of the DA surge and condensate panels, and then also combination panels. Now we've talked about the master panel. So there's only one, one more piece of the puzzle that I want to talk about briefly here, and that's the protocol converter. Now the protocol converter is just a simple communication interface to building management systems, okay? So it's just a translator. And what it's gonna do is gonna take all the Modbus data that we have on all these various devices and convert it to whatever you need it to be, okay? And all the protocols we have available are BACnet, Ethernet, BACnet MSTP, Metasys, LawnWorks, Profinet, and Profibus. So you can take this protocol converter and communicate to multiple touchscreens and then have one output that goes to the, the BMS. And that's pretty advantageous in certain situations, and I'm gonna talk about those, those situations in just a minute here. So, putting it all together, let's take an example here where we have three boilers that all have LMV5s on them, and they have a local touchscreen kit connected to that LMV5. Now, this touchscreen kit might be separate in a, in a standalone panel that's next to the burner, or it might be actually built into the burner cabinet um, or the boiler cabinet. Now, let's say we also have a DA tank with a DA panel built into it. And this is a steam system. So each one of these boilers is going to be producing steam into a steam header and then sending it out to the building. So we're going to take each one of these panels, the DA panel and all three local touchscreen kits, and connect them to the master panel via an Ethernet connection. Okay, so this is Modbus over an Ethernet connection. So this is just a, a typical Cat5 looking cable um, that's going to go one from each kit back to the master panel. Then we're also gonna connect a header pressure sensor to the master panel. Now, this is something that we see a lot of people miss in the field. Um, they install the master panel and then um, they neglect to install the header pressure sensor and then the system's unavailable and they have to try to figure that out when they're trying to start the system up. Don't forget to set up the header pressure sensor and wire it back to the master panel. It needs to have that, otherwise the system won't work, okay? So <clears throat> once you have all that set up, then you give you put the protocol necessary for this application into the master panel, and then that master panel will communicate all the information from the DA and the boilers and the header pressure um, and anything else you have connected to the master panel 
back to the building management system. Now, if you didn't have a master panel and you had all of these devices and you still needed BACnet, this is where you would use the protocol converter. Okay? So you take all these devices, just like we were showing, and we would connect all of them back to a single protocol converter, and that protocol converter would then communicate BACnet to the building management system or Profinet or whatever protocol you need. So another example might be that you have three LMVs on boilers, but you don't have any touchscreens. Okay. Again, we have a DA tank with a DA panel. There's no, there's no real way to, to communicate all the information from the DA to a master panel without a local touchscreen because we need a control device of some kind to lead lag all the pumps, um, and so you need the panel. There's some simple things you could do if you didn't want to have a touchscreen at the DA, like you could monitor a temperature or you can monitor some pressures um, using the analog and RTD inputs on the master panel. Um, but you're not going to get the kind of information, kind of operating information that you would if you had a local touchscreen. Okay. So for this example, we're going to have a DA tank with a DA panel on it as well. And then again, steam system. To connect these from the master panel, we're going to add serial communication kits to each one of these LMVs. Now these serial comm kits basically translate the native Modbus RS-232 to Modbus RS-485. And the reason we do that is Modbus 232 can only go about 15 feet before the signal degrades. Now once you convert it to RS-485, it can go thousands of feet, no problem. Okay, and obviously boilers in a boiler room aren't gonna be 15 feet or less apart. So we're gonna need these serial comm kits to communicate back to the master panel. So in order to communicate back to the master panel, the connection is slightly different. The DA is still gonna connect Modbus over an Ethernet connection back to the master panel. But for the boilers, we're actually gonna daisy chain all of these serial comm kits together and then have one wire that goes back to the master panel. Okay. It's a really simple setup once you add the serial comm kits, um, but this gives you the ability to tie all those boilers together back to the master panel without touch screens at the boiler. Okay. Again, you still need to connect the header pressure sensor to the master panel. Don't forget to do that part. And then, once you have all that set up, you put whatever protocol you need in the master panel and it goes right to your BMS. And again, if you don't have a master panel, you have one protocol converter that you connect all these devices to, and then that would connect back to the building management system. The protocol converter option here is much more um, advantageous because you don't have to have a protocol converter for each device, like each boiler or each DA or tank. Um, it's also easier for the BMS guys because they don't have all these different protocol converters they have to worry about. They just have one that has multiple connections. Uh, so it does really come in, come in handy in, in a lot of situations. So <clears throat> it's important to remember that you don't have to use one connection type uh, exclusively. You could have multiple kinds of connection types. So here we go through a couple examples of that. So again, DA tank with a DA panel, Modbus via an Ethernet connection. You'd also have maybe a new burner with an LMV and a touchscreen kit built into it. And again, because it has a touchscreen kit, we're gonna use one uh, Ethernet connection back to the master panel. Maybe you have a retrofit in a box, okay? You've got a combustion enclosure that you did a control retrofit on one of the boilers in the boiler room. And again, that would be, because it has a touch screen, it's going to be another Cat5 cable that goes back to the master panel, uh, Ethernet cable. But then let's say you have two boilers in the boiler room that have LMVs. Um, they're not ready to be upgraded to touch screens or to new burners of some kind. Um, and you wanna bring those into the master panel. So this is again where we'd add the serial comm kits and then we'd daisy chain them together back to the master panel, just like this, okay? So now you've got four boilers, um, two different kinds of connections, both the, the uh, Ethernet connections and the serial connections, and you've tied together all four of these boilers, okay? So you've done a new boiler, maybe you did a new burner upgrade on boiler number one, you did a controls upgrade on boiler number two, and boiler number three and four had LMVs on them already, so you're just gonna leave those alone for now uh, and not add a touchscreen kit. Now, Maybe there's a fifth boiler, and that fifth boiler is still a linkage boiler, right? So it's got really no advanced controls on it at all. What you could do is add an LMV, I'm sorry, you could add an RWF55 only to that boiler or burner, and then you could daisy chain it back into the serial comm kits like I'm showing here, 
And then you could bring that boiler into the fold here and into the master panel so that it could be used in the lead lag sequencing. Okay, so it's a nice way to kind of bring that those additional boilers in that are still stuck in uh, linkage controls, but maybe the boiler room or the end user doesn't have them funds to upgrade at this time, but they want to be able to bring everything together with the lead lag panel. Okay, that's a nice way that you can do that by using the RWF55. Basically, what you need to do is replace the load controller that exists on that burner now with the RWF55 load controller, which has Modbus, which we can, can communicate to the master panel. Okay, you're not going to get nearly as much applications, but you will get information about what the um, firing rate is and what the process variable is for that boiler itself. And then, just like all the other examples, you would then send all this information to the building management system via the master panel. And if you didn't have a master panel, you could use a protocol converter in this application again, just like the other examples we talked about. All right, so let's walk through a typical steam generation plant and all the different devices that are in a boiler room. And uh, I'll show you where all of our various devices can be installed. So let's take a look at this boiler room and we'll kind of follow the water through this example. So the water's coming into the system, it's first gonna hit the water softener, okay? From there, the water might go down into something like a blowdown heat recovery system. From there, we're gonna pump water into the surge tank. And the surge tank is gonna pump water into the DA tank. And the deaerator is gonna pump water into the economizer, which is then gonna have water flow into the boiler. From the boiler, you're gonna have some surface blowdown that's going to the blowdown heat recovery system, um, where you're gonna transfer heat from that surface blowdown back into your fresh water. Um, to kind of recover some of that energy. You're going to have some flash steam that comes off of there, and then hopefully we can pipe that back into the DA tank. There's also going to be some bottom blowdown. The bottom blowdown is not very useful, so it's just going to go to a flash tank and then to the drain. And then finally, you have your, your steam coming off the boiler, and that's going to your steam process. Um, there's probably going to be some of that steam siphoned back into the DA tank in order to keep the DA tank at, a uh, let's say, 5 PSI, which is pretty typical. And then the, the steam coming out of the steam process is going to be collected, hopefully, by a splash tank. And then you're going to send that condensate back to the surge tank. Okay? Some systems send it back to the surge tank. Some systems send it back to the DA tank. It just depends on what um, the system design looks like. Now, we made that <clears throat> condensate line yellow or gold because uh, it, is, it is liquid gold. I mean, that's in terms of a system um, saving money, bringing as much condensate back to the system as possible is a good way to save, save the end user a bunch of money on their fuel costs and chemical costs and all kinds of costs. <clears throat> so it really makes your system more efficient. So first off, temperature sensors. SEC can supply the temperature sensors for all these various devices. Uh, and basically anywhere you have a heat exchanger, knowing the differential across that heat exchanger can tell you a lot of information about how well that heat exchanger is working. So the blowdown heat recovery system we have down here, this is a heat exchanger, so knowing the differential across this is important. The economizer, knowing the differential across the water and across the fluid temperature uh, is important. Knowing the boiler temperature, a belly sensor perhaps. Um, you could even add one in to measure the temperature of the DA tank. Um, you could have a temperature sensor for the condensate return. So anywhere you need a temperature sensor, we have the, the temperature sensor you're going to need. Next up, water level control. So we have water level control that's needed on the surge tank the DA tank and the boiler, and we can use our differential pressure transducer, RW55, and our 599 valves to accommodate water level on any of these devices. VFDs, uh, we can supply VFDs for the surge tank pumps or DA tank pumps. We can supply them for the blower um, on the boiler itself. So <clears throat> VFDs that you guys might need, we can help supply with that as well. Pressure sensors. We have the pressure sensors that we can connect to, let's say, the, uh, the DA tank here in this example, and then also the, the um, boiler pressure sensor. And then steam, steam valves. The 599 valves can also act as a steam valve, and so you could actually use it to control the DA tank pressure um, by connecting a 599 valve with an SKC actuator, and then using an RW55 to monitor the tank pressure, and then control that valve um, so that you have the right pressure in the DA tank. And actually, on the DA tank panel, 
you can add that RWD55 right into that panel that will control that pressure. We can also add metering. So we have steam flow meters that you can install on the, on the outgoing steam from the, the boilers. Feed water meters, we use maglev meters, I'm sorry, magnetic meters um, on the feed water meters that go into the boiler. We can also use them for makeup water meters. Okay, so we have all these various devices now, um, and once we have all these end devices installed, oh, I'm sorry, fuel flow meters as well. You have fuel flow meters installed on the burner to measure how much fuel you're using. Now we add in the panels. So we've got a surge tank panel maybe, and a DA tank panel as well. A local boiler touchscreen kit, perhaps, that's connected to the LMV3 or the LMV5 that's in this panel, or in this burner, I'm sorry. And then tying everything together, we'd have a master panel, okay? So in this example, I'm only showing one boiler, but theoretically, maybe in this example, you'd have multiple boilers, or this is boiler one, maybe boiler two is to the right, and boiler three, and so on and so forth. And each one of those might have all these same devices, and then each one of those panels would connect back to the master panel to give you sort of a multiple boiler boiler room. So that's how everything sort of ties together. And the goal is with all of these end devices that have all this information here, what we want to do at the end of the day is provide one cohesive control solution to the end user that they're happy with that gets you on and then off the job quickly so you can get on to the next one. Okay. So <clears throat> everything that we do here with the total boiler solutions is designed for this, this one goal here is to give the end user one cohesive control solution that they can use and they feel comfortable with. They get all the information about their system nice and neatly. Okay. That concludes my presentation on the SCC Total Boiler Solutions 101, the product overview. Um, there are additional webinars that we'll be giving to dive deeper into each one of these types of panels and how you can use them, how to quote them, how to design a system using them, um, and we'll definitely dive deeper into those applications in future webinars. We had some really great questions actually come in during the presentation, so I just want to go through a few of those here um, and explain some of the answers that we had. So the first one they had um, was, what is three-element feed water control? <clears throat> and this is a great question. Three-element feed water control, well, let's start with single-element feed water control first. So single-element feed water control basically looks at just where the water level is in the boiler. So all it really knows is where the water level is. It doesn't know how quickly water, water is coming in or how quickly steam is going out. And that's where three-element feed water comes into play. So in three-element feed water, you have a steam flow meter that's monitoring how much steam exits the boiler. And then we also have a water flow meter that's monitoring how much water is entering the boiler. And the reason that's important is in, in certain applications where there might be large swings in demand for steam, you might have a situation where all of a sudden your steam demand spikes and then that steam flow will suck steam out of the boiler so quickly that the water level will drop very, very quickly. And in order to protect against that, if you have a steam flow meter monitoring how much steam is leaving the boiler, it can compensate for that large demand that suddenly happens. And so it can open up the water valve before the water level actually starts to drop too quickly. Okay. The next one here we had was, is there a PLC? If there is a PLC, why did the RWF 55 not get included into the programming for water level? Um, that's a great question. So when you're doing three or three or yeah, three element feed water control, the PLC is actually handling the um, loop control for the feed water. But if you're not doing three element feed water control, you could use an RWF 55 to handle your feed water. And the reason you do that is because it gives you a little bit of redundancy or backup, essentially. If you're using an RWF 55 to handle your feed water control, if the PLC dies or the touchscreen dies for some reason, um, you can still run the boiler because the RWF 55 is all you need to control the water level in the boiler, and then the LMV is all you need to control the uh, burner. Uh, which actually kind of leads to another point that I want to make real quickly is that all of the products are designed so that if, if one part goes down, it sort of reverts back to the more local control. So if for some reason you have a system that has a master panel with some local touchscreens and some LMVs. If for some reason the master panel were to go down due to some you know, catastrophic event, <clears throat> the local touchscreens have a watchdog timer that says, hey, I haven't been getting any information from the master panel for the last 30 seconds. I'm just gonna revert back to local control 
and run my boiler locally. And the same thing happens with the LMV. If for some reason a local touchscreen um, is damaged and it's not able to be used, the LMV, th LMV 5 or 3 has a watchdog timer in it that will notice and say, okay, I've lost communication. I'm just going to go back to local control. And that way we have, we have the ability to always have, have the boiler available, even if you were to lose some of these comfort features. Okay. Uh, another good question that I got here was, uh, does draft control require a separate loop controller? Uh, no. The draft control program is built into the touchscreen program, so you don't have to have a separate loop controller to do that. Um, if for some reason the touchscreen or that uh, local screen were to fail for some reason, the draft control reverts to full open so that we're, we're just kind of fail safe in that situation. Uh, one more good question here we had was, will it, the presentation be available online on demand after this webinar? And that's absolutely the case that we have here. What we're going to do is we will send you a link in a follow-up email that will come out tomorrow morning. And that link will be able to uh, send you directly to a place that you can view this, this webinar. It's being recorded as we speak right now. We're also going to have a spot on our website that allows you to view these webinars in the future and download them um, so that you can use them. One other question I got here was on a hydronic full flow system, how would boiler isolation valve control work? Would we be able to keep one isolation valve open at all times so not to deadhead the system pump? Yes, you can definitely do that, but you need to be using the master panel and the master panel needs to be controlling the isolation pumps. We have two options in controlling the isolation pumps. The local touchscreen kits or combustion enclosures can control the isolation valves. But if you want the ability to leave one valve open at all times, let's say the lead boiler valve is always open, even if the lead boiler is off, then you need to be using the control that is set up in the master panel to control the isolation valves. So you basically need to wire the isolation valves back to the master panel in order to achieve that setup. Training, uh, that's a great question. Uh, what other additional training do we have for these panels? Uh, unfortunately, right now, we are all kind of stuck at home and not able to get together due to the, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. But once that travel ban is lifted and the, the world kind of goes back to normal, we have a great training room at our facility in Chicago that allows us to bring people in and we can have all the panels set up in the room. And so we can actually walk through real life situations of how to set up the panel, how to configure them for specific applications. We use it a lot for troubleshooting. If people call in and have an issue with their panels, we'll go in that room, we'll set up whatever they're trying to do, and we'll be able to see you know, what, what they're seeing in the field. Uh, and we have a whole class uh, designed for sales training on these panels. We also have classes that are be coming out soon on just technical training for these, these classes that are more suited for techs that will be in the field commissioning these panels. So lots of training is totally available uh, at SEC Inc. Uh, we can also do some on-site training. Uh, we're happy to come out to do some training for your techs when there's a, you know, you've got your first or second job you've got coming on with these panels. We're happy to come out and do some training. Uh, and also we can do some, some, some demonstration in, a, in an office setting with uh, demos that we have available. Um, but uh, the best way to do this kind of training really is at our facility where we can kind of get really hands-on with all the various panels that are in our training facility. There are many communication protocols that will talk with a BMS. Do they all come standard and you just select one or does the system need to be ordered with a specific protocol? Uh, that's a good question and it's got a bit of a nuanced answer. The simple answer is yes, you need to order it with the correct protocol. Um, there are certain situations where if, uh, let's say you order it with BACnet IP, but you need BACnet MSTP, there is a way to kind of reconfigure that in the field. But the best way to do is make sure that you got that right the first time and, and order it that way. Uh, but there is a way, you know, to kind of fix that with either some small hardware changes in the field. But like I said, ideally, you just really need to kind of get that straight in the beginning and that way it'll, it'll make it the easiest. Is programmable low fire hold available for bringing up lag boilers, either a time variable or temperature release to high fire? Uh, also a great question. The master panel has the ability to do both hot standby and low fire hold. Um, so low fire hold is also called thermal shock protection. It's also called cold start. And basically low fire hold says when my boiler is cold and it turns on for the first time, I want to hold it at low fire and prevent it from ramping up and potentially causing some thermal shock. 
And we do that using a temperature sensor in the boiler that measures the boiler water temperature. And the master panel can monitor those temperature sensors and determine what firing rate to put the boiler at as it turns on. It also has the ability to do hot standby or warm standby, some people call it, which basically says, if I have, let's say, a four boiler setup, and I typically only need about two boilers to carry the load, but every once in a while I'll need that third boiler, and I don't want to have to wait for that third boiler to do a cold start procedure where it takes you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 to 30 minutes for it to warm up before I can actually use it. So hot standby says, okay, I've got boiler one and boiler two running. Let's just keep boiler three warm and basically keep the water temperature above, I don't know, let's say 250 degrees or something like that, so that when I do call for that third boiler, it's ready to go and it'll start right up and can, can modulate up to high fire when, it, when I call for it. Great question. That's, that's all built into the master panel programming and in future webinars that we do specifically for the master panel, we can talk um, in more detail about how to set that up and all the various parameters that surround those, those two functions. Are there sample specifications available for these products? Uh, absolutely. There's a documentation including technical instructions, installation instructions, and specifications can all be found on our website, uh, sccombustion.com. That's sccombustion.com. Um, and from the website there, like I said, there's three different pieces of documentation for each one of these types of panels. The technical instructions are going to give you uh, information about the part number structure. It's also going to give you information about how the panel lays out and what size they are. It's also going to tell you, um, give you the wiring diagrams. The installation instructions are going to be quite a bit bigger, and these are the ones that are going to show you how to set the panels up. So they're going to walk you screen by screen to show you how to set up the panel for various applications. And then the sample specifications are just that. They're a sample specification for that panel, and it shows you exactly what, uh, what's, what you can put in a specification. And those, again, are all available on our secombustion.com website. If you need help finding the, the specific document that you're looking for, uh, feel free to reach out to your SEC account manager or send an email into our marketing at secombustion.com email, and we'll, we'll find a way to get you that information. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. This was, uh, this was really great. I'm excited to do some more of these in the future. Um, feel free to send in your comments and questions to our marketing email or get a hold of your SCC account manager. If you don't know who your SCC account manager is, feel free to email our marketing uh, email address and we'll get a hold of, of, of the right person for you. Uh, and look for some, some more webinars coming in the future. We'll, we're hoping to, to host quite a few more of these especially since it seems like everybody right now is working from home and uh, this is a good way to kind of reach out and connect with everybody. So thank you very much for attending and uh, stay safe and have a wonderful day.